Good morning and welcome to our talk this morning, the second in this series, Thinking About Prayer. If you joined us last week, you know we were in uh, the first few verses of Luke 11 looking at Jesus' teaching on prayer because his disciples have asked a really fantastic question, how should we pray? And in these verses Jesus teaches them how to pray. And last week we looked particularly at the content of our prayers uh, using the Lord's Prayer which Jesus gives uh, as a model for us. I don't know about you, I've had quite a bit of a chance to reflect on that this week. One of my particular focus in my prayer life has been hallowing God's name because you have time of praise and worship of our great and glorious God. But Jesus, not only this passage teaches us how to pray in giving us a pattern and example, he also helps us think about our attitude to prayer and also our expectations as we pray. And sitting behind uh, these things, I think, is often a question that many of us may have been tempted to ask. Why does God not seem to answer my prayers? Is that a question you've ever asked? Have you ever thought, God, I've prayed about this, but you don't seem to have done anything, or what you've done is not what I wanted? Have you ever felt like that? And they, that those questions, they, of course, they come with all sorts of other questions attached, don't they? Things like, what's God like? Does God love me? Is God good? Why is he not answering this prayer? Well, the great news is our passage today is going to tackle head on some of those questions. So if you've uh, got a Bible in front of you or you're on screen, why don't we just turn to these verses and we're going to start with verses 5 to 10 which is all about our attitude to prayer and they're using the words of the text and uh, this passage calls us to be audacious in our prayer life to be bold and persistent and I just love that word audacious are we audacious in our prayer lives and Jesus begins to make his point by telling a story and it's absolutely rooted in first century hospitality in our COVID world, it seems slightly strange, but let's uh, have a look at it. So imagine it's late at night and someone's friend uh, comes to visit. Maybe it was one of your friends who comes to visit and say, hello, I've just turned up out of the blue. Now, in our culture, it seems unlikely. In COVID culture, not allowed. But in those days, that did happen. You couldn't send a message in advance, quick WhatsApp, oh, I'm going to be here soon. No, you just turn up out of the blue. And the social custom of the time was if a visitor came, even in the middle of the night, you welcomed them in and gave them a meal. Anyway, so you welcome the friend and then you go to say, oh, I'm going to serve you some food. Oh, you haven't got anything. And at the time, not having anything to offer your guest would not have looked good. So what you decide to do is head next door, uh, bang on the door and uh, say, hello, have you got any bread? Uh, I need some to feed my guest. Jesus' little story, the friend next door is in bed and the door is locked. But Jesus says, because the request is completely audacious, uh, the person living next door, your friend, goes and gets you some bread, not because they're a friend, but because of your boldness in asking for it. I love the way the NIV puts it. Yet because of your shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. There's a boldness to this request. Now, I don't know, are you an audacious type of person? Are you the sort of person who likes to make really bold requests of others? I remember I once uh, had a friend of mine who wanted a new job. Do you know what he did? He went up to the person he wanted to work for and said, can I have a job? I would never do that. It's just not my temperament. But he did, and actually he got a job. Um, have you ever been the sort of person who audaciously asked for a pay rise? And if someone else who did that said, oh, can I have a pay rise? And they got one. Bold. Audacious. Well, Jesus is making the same point. We need to be bold and audacious in our prayer lives. And have a look at verses 9 and 10. What will happen if we are, Jesus says. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus, talking about prayer, says we are to be audacious in asking God for things. We're to speak to God as our Father, and we're to make bold requests. Now, I'm conscious this is all tied up with expectations. And how will God answer prayer? And that's part two of the talk. But I think what I want us to hear now is the point Jesus is making. Are we audacious in our personal prayer lives? Are we audacious in our prayer life as a church? Are we big and bold in what we're asking God for? I've been a Christian over 20 years now. And I think I've reflected back as I was preparing this talk. God does answer audacious prayer requests. Even in the last 12 months of this pandemic, God has answered prayer. I have a little book which I write down uh, prayer points when people from either church bring me up or send me an email so I can remember to pray for them. So over the, as I was preparing this talk, I flicked back to last March and looked at some of the things that people asked me to pray for. Do you know what? As I look back over the course of the last 12 months, what do I see? I've seen people healed. I've seen people kept safe when working in challenging environments. We've seen people come to Christian faith. We've seen lives changed by the Holy Spirit. And we're seeing a small but growing list of people who want to be baptised or confirmed. Now, humanly speaking, you wouldn't have expected all those different prayers to be answered. But when you look at In a totality, you think God has been at work. The question is, have we been audacious enough in what we've prayed for? Over the last 12 months at St Matthew's, um, we decided the time would come to need a new screen. If you've been in the building and there, it sort of stands on three chairs and can't even be read at the back of the building. So it's a bit hopeless. Um, So we had this vision to do it. We launched it just uh, before the pandemic struck. But if you know the building, it's big, and when you wanted a drop down screen, £22,000. And when you go out to a congregation in the middle of a pandemic and say, would you be willing to give £22,000? Humanly speaking, it looks like it won't happen. I think quite a few people in the church family were fairly sceptical. And yet we prayed, pretty audaciously, I think we prayed at times, and God provided within £50 of what we needed. And that screen will be installed in March. Audacious prayer requests. Another story I remember is when Tracy and I first got married. We were at a church up in central London and they really had a vision to develop ministry to international students. And so they wanted to employ someone to do the work. And so we began praying. And we prayed and prayed for this post. And firstly, God provided the finances. That was great. He raised up a generosity within the life of the church to pay for the post. Then they went out to advert and they found a superb person they wanted to appoint. And But this person was Singaporean and didn't have a visa. So back to prayer we went, pray, pray, pray uh, that the Lord would provide a visa. And he did. And I remember at the time it was a pretty audacious prayer because in normal circumstances a visa should not have been forthcoming. God provided. And again, it reminds me, are we audacious enough in our prayer lives and what we ask God? I look back to life before we were married. Tracy and I, um, we met at a church in central London. We were there for eight years. And uh, it was part of the culture of the church. It was on the first Wednesday of every month. uh, They'd have the main church family prayer meeting. And it was a prayer meeting that was really well attended. I've never seen it like that at any other church. About two thirds of the church would turn up to the prayer meeting, and that's pretty rare. And at the time, I didn't really think anything of it. It was just church. We just all turned up and we prayed. But again, it's pretty bold what we pray, because I look back in over those eight years, and I thought, what did God do? As Tracy and I were talking, in eight years, five new churches were planted. We planted churches in Clapham, Earlsfield, Fulham, Chelsea, Battersea. Two onto housing estates, two for families, one for young professionals. 
I was involved in the student ministry. During that eight year period, it tripled in size from 20 up to about 60 students. We saw dozens of people come to Christian faith. We saw lives changed and many sent off for theological training and for Christian service here in this country and abroad. And you, I look back and I think that was an amazing part of what God did. But then I thought, but I wonder if it was connected to the fact that we prayed. And we prayed big prayers and we asked God to do audacious things. We prayed for workers and finance, it's, which we didn't have. We prayed for churches that were yet to be planted. We prayed for people to come to know Jesus, who at that point knew nothing about Jesus whatsoever. And God answered them. So here's my challenge. As I prepared this talk, it, it challenged me. It, what's my prayer life like? Am I audacious? Am I big enough? Am I bold enough in what I'm praying? Are we, St Matthews and St Ethelbergis, together audacious in what we want God to do? And will we pray and ask him to do it? I think this part of the passage says that our attitude is to be one of boldness and being audacious in what we pray for. Okay, so that's the first thing. Bold and audacious. Secondly, we have our expectations. Let me read again, verses 11 to 13. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We know from the beginning of the chapter that we're to pray to God as our Father. So what should be our expectations as we pray? I think this is the point. Our expectation should be that our Heavenly Father is good. And he wants to give us good gifts. Jesus' story. No human father gives their child a snake when they ask for a fish. No human father gives their child a scorpion when they ask for eggs. And Jesus' point is this. If, if, if a human father won't do that, well, of course our Heavenly Father won't do that either. And if we won't do that as flawed humans, well, God is never going to do that. God will always give us what is good. Right, again, as I was preparing this, this just reminded me of a song. As a family, we enjoy listening to Christian music uh, and quite a lot of children's Christian music. And there's an album from Sovereign uh, Grace Kids, uh, which has got the parables of Luke. And there's a song based off this difficult story. But let me just read it to you. Little Johnny came home from school, hungry, tired, needing some fuel. Went to find some fish sticks in the fridge. Johnny's dad was standing there, said, sit on down, son, and I'll prepare. You'll never guess what that dad did. Whoa, whoa, what's the deal? He served up the weirdest meal. Sliding on his dinner plate, Johnny saw a rattlesnake. Chorus, no good father's going to give us something like that. Uh-uh, no way. Our good father always does us good when we ask. But you've got to pray. Verse 2. Little Susie woke up one day, hungering, hankering for some eggs. When in the room, her dad appeared. And then he gave her something strange. Didn't help her hunger pains. In fact, her brown eyes filled with tears. Hey, hey, my oh my, what'd she see and why'd she cry? Breakfast made her want to run. It was a scorpion. Chorus again. No good father's going to give us something like that. Uh-uh, no way. Our good father always does us good when we ask, but you've got to pray. Keep asking, keep happening, keep knocking, it'll open. Keep praying, keep seeking. God knows just what we're needing. A simple little song, but it makes the point. No good father's going to give us something rubbish. But our good father's always going to give us the best, but we've got to pray. 
And then this passage ends, and I just find this fascinating. What is the one thing that God always promises to give us? He will always give us the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the gift that he will always give us. At this point, let me say something about unanswered prayer. Because it's challenging, isn't it? You pray for something, and you, God doesn't always respond as you expect. At this point, I think we have to know to trust that God is a good father. It comes back to trusting God and his character. And he knows what is best for us. And sometimes what we think is best is not always the best thing for us. The challenge I see in this passage and the challenge I know I've had to learn is trusting God. That his answers to my prayers are good, even if they're not what I expect. Let me just take one example. So you know, when I came here, one of the uh, promises, sort of, that was made was that there would be some funding, at least, for a pioneer minister post across our two churches. I know it's something we prayed about, and we've certainly talked about at PCCs and with churches. But when we went to put in the bids last summer, they all failed. And it doesn't even ask the question, why? We prayed, it seemed a good thing to do, we, we try and do something good, why did it fail? And it got tougher recently when I was told even the small amount of funding that might have been available has had to be pulled because of Covid. How do we deal with that? Well, this passage has to teach my heart, even when that's really hard. That God is good. I have a good Father, and He will always give me what I need, and He'll give us as churches what we need as a good Father. We need to trust Him. And as we think about our ministry here, God promises the one thing that will make the most difference the Holy Spirit. What's the one thing He promises? He will always give us the thing that can transform lives the Holy Spirit so to verse 13 I need to claim God is a good father he'll give the Holy Spirit and he will do his work here because he is good so what are our expectations of prayer well, our expectation must be that God is good he'll give us what is best for us and we need to trust him. So as we come to the end of week two of this series on prayer, last week we saw that challenge about the content of our prayer life. Today we've been challenged to be audacious in prayer, to an attitude of asking boldly. What are we asking God boldly to do? And are we going to get on our knees and do it? We've also been reminded of our expectations. We need to trust that God is good. And he will always answer our prayers for good. We may not fully understand that. There's many things that God does I don't fully understand, but I am not God. I am but a creature. We need to trust him. But we need to also know he will always give us his Holy Spirit. And this is through the power of the Holy Spirit that people are saved. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives are changed. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that a community is transformed. So let's cling to and trust in that wonderful promise. Let's pray. Our Father, hallowed be your name. And so Father, we ask that your kingdom might come. Help us to be bold, to be audacious in prayer. Help us to trust you that you are good, even when that's hard. And thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd pour it out into our lives to make us more like Christ. For your glory. Amen.